Welcome back everybody. In the last video we talked about chemistry and we talked about electrons and protons and atoms, all very very small things. Today we're going to be talking about macromolecules. A macromolecule has lots and lots and lots of different atoms in it. And there are four main types of macromolecules. Carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. Three of these four are polymers. What's a polymer? Polymers are made from monomers. So if you look at the pop beads at the bottom, you can see that they're all slightly different and they're all simple, simple subunits. We call them building blocks. When you string lots of monomers together into a long chain, we call that a polymer. So the monomers get covalently bonded together to make long chains that we call polymer. The polymers can either be made of lots of different subunits, as in the polymer on the top, all the different colors of pop beads, or they can be repeating subunits of exactly the same pop bead. So three of our four types of macromolecules are made from monomers. Lipids are not made from repeating small subunits. We make a polymer using something called a dehydration reaction. It's called dehydration reaction because we're taking away water. So when you take away a water, it allows for a covalent bond to form between the last monomer on the chain and the unlinked monomer. This causes a longer and longer polymer to grow. We can also break down polymers. This is called hydrolysis, hydrolysis. So we're adding water back in to break apart that covalent bond. So let's talk about our four different types of macromolecules. The first one is going to be carbohydrates. The monomer, or the repeating subunit of carbohydrates, is called a monosaccharide. These are simple sugars, things like glucose or fructose. This is a molecule of glucose. It can go back and forth between a ring form on the right and a linear form on the left. And they're usually made of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. If you take two monosaccharides, like glucose and fructose, both simple building blocks, and you go through a dehydration synthesis reaction, you can link them together to become a disaccharide. Di means two. And in this case, the disaccharide that we made is called sucrose, which is table sugar. You can also make an oligosaccharide. And this would be like putting between three and 20 of, mon of those monosaccharides together. Once you get more than 20 monosaccharides together, we can finally call it a polysaccharide. This is the polymer for carbohydrates. There's two main functions that we use polysaccharides for. We use them for long-term energy storage. In animal cells, we um, make glycogen. and plant cells, we make starch. We also use polysaccharides for structural molecules. Our second type of macromolecule that we're going to talk about are proteins. More than 50% of the mass of your cell are proteins. DNA codes for proteins, and proteins make everything else. The monomer for proteins is called an amino acid, and all amino acids have this basic structure. They have an alpha carbon. On the left side, they have an amino group, and on the right side, they have a carboxyl group. They're attached to a hydrogen, and then you see where they have a side chain, it's labeled the R group. That's different in every amino acid. So all the amino acids are exactly the same on the bottom part. The only thing that's different between them is the R group. And there are, in fact, 20 common amino acids. We can have four different levels of structure. The primary structure of a protein is the sequence of those amino acids in the polypeptide chain. So think about beads on a string. You could put on a green bead and a blue bead and a yellow bead and maybe two orange beads and that would be the sequence of beads on your string. Likewise when we make a protein we're going to put a sequence of a specific kind of amino acids in a row on a string. That's the primary structure. The secondary structure would be local twists and folds of the polypeptide. Imagine again you have a long bead necklace, maybe so long that it stretches across your entire room. If there were some foldings in part of it near the door, that would be a local folding. The entire necklace isn't twisted and folded up, just the part near your door. That would be the secondary structure. These are local folds and twists and this is caused by hydrogen bonding between 
amino acids. They can either find, form coils that we call alpha helices, or they can form what we call beta pleated sheet, which is sort of like a fan. If you fold a, a piece of paper up into a fan, it makes that type of shape. The tertiary structure of a protein is really the three-dimensional shape of the protein. So imagine again your long bead necklace stretching from one side of your room to the other side of the room. The primary structure is the order of the colors of the beads on the necklace. The secondary structure would be small little foldings in different parts of the bead necklace. The tertiary structure is if you took the entire bead necklace and you wadded it up so that you could hold it in your hand. In proteins, this three-dimensional shape is determined by interactions between the R groups. There are hydrogen bonds, are disulfide bridges, are ionic bonds, and there are hydrophobic interactions. It's not until a protein gets to this tertiary structure that it's actually functional. When it's all strung out, like a long bead necklace, it doesn't have the correct function because it doesn't have the correct shape. You have to fold up a protein to get the proper shape. So tertiary structure where it is the lowest level at which the protein is functional. Some proteins stop there, but other proteins have a fourth level of structure, and that's called quaternary structure. So if you have two or more polypeptide chains that are in tertiary structure already, they can come together into a complex that works to do the job. So for example, we have two different proteins here. Transthyretin is a transport protein in your cerebrospinal fluid, and it carries thyroid hormone around. It's made of two tertiary structure proteins, that come together in a quaternary structure. Collagen, which is all over the place in your connective tissue, is actually made up of three long chains of proteins, each of which are separate. They come together in quaternary structure to make collagen. Now, proteins can be denatured. This is when the hydrogen bonds, the ionic bonds, the disulfide bridges, etc., get destroyed. They can be destroyed by heat, they can be destroyed by chemicals, by acids. When it is denatured, the primary structure is still usually intact, which means the pe those peptide bonds that are holding the amino acids together are not destroyed. So it still has its primary structure, but it's lost secondary and tertiary structure. This is a non-functional protein. Because it doesn't have the correct shape, it cannot do its job. Sometimes it's possible to renature a protein back to its normal shape. So the minimal level of protein structure, where the protein is functional, what do you think? Stop and answer. Did you answer tertiary structure? If you do, you are correct. The protein needs to be folded up to be functional. Our next set of macromolecules is nucleic acids. The monomer here is a nucleotide. A nucleotide is a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate group. Nucleic acid's job is to store and express hereditary information. There are five different nitrogenous bases, cytosine, thymine, uracil, adenine, and guanine. We'll talk about those later. And there's two different types of pentose sugars. Deoxyribose is in DNA, and ribose is in RNA. So you can see there's actually an oxygen missing from deoxyribose. When you string all of those nucleotides together, you get something called a polynucleotide. So again, this is a polymer. It is a long chain of repeating monomers. These are held together by something called phosphodiester bonds, which we will get into later. Another nucleic acid that we don't think about too much as being a nucleic acid, but it is ATP. This is something that we use in the cell, and you can see it has a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and in this case it has three phosphate molecules. These phosphate molecules release energy when they're broken, so it's a great way for the cell to store energy for short term. Our last type of macromolecule are lipids, and remember these are not polymers. These are nonpolar molecules. Do you remember what nonpolar means? There's no difference in charge between the two sides of the molecule. They're hydrophobic and they're insoluble in water. And there are three major types of lipids, triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids. Triglycerides, or fats, 
are made up of a couple different subunits, but again, these are not repeating subunits. The subunits can all be quite different. So we have a glycerol backbone, and it has three fatty acid tails on it. And the fatty acids are just made up of carbons and hydrogens. Our phospholipids are similar to our triglycerides, except for one of those fatty acid tails has been removed. So we still have a glycerol, and we still have two fatty acids, but in place of the third fatty acid, we actually have a phosphate group. Now this is polar. So the phosphate head group is charged and polar, and the fatty acid tails are nonpolar. So we call this an amphipathic molecule. One side is polar and one side is nonpolar. The reason we care so much about phospholipids is because they are a major component of your plasma membrane. The third type of lipids are steroids. These are the precursor for steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen. And this is really quite different. You can see there's four fused rings that have largely nonpolar covalent bonds holding them together. So which macromolecule is not made up of monomers? Lipids. All right, thanks for watching. See you in class.